It's good to see everybody back. Uh, this is our final week of creeds, confessions, and sacraments. And um, it's, been, it's been a great couple of weeks. I hope today is, is also very uh, insightful and helpful. I know it has been for me. I will remind us as we begin this final week uh, in this uh, series that, again, uh, we've been looking really primarily the objective of this class, the deliverable, is to gain the understanding and the appreciation for the origins, views, and significance of what are distinctly Christian practices in order that, that conjunctive or we've seen that in Romans a lot, in order that uh, we might grow in our personal worship and that we would be equipped for opportunities of gospel sharing, that life on mission uh, is actually uh, even more fulfilled and available when we can speak to some of these practices um, out in the world. So that's really our objective. I hope that uh, we've, we've made some progress on that, and I think we'll do, do so again today. Uh, we have, as I've mentioned, uh, we've had uh, creeds, confessions, catechisms. Uh, we looked at uh, communion, Lord's Supper, Eucharist last week. I told uh, Pastor Beatty that after our conversation that we are all ready to go back to a common cup at communion. <laughs> No, maybe, okay, well, we're talking. Okay, anyway, we, at least we understand it. Uh, and today we're going to be looking at baptism. Baptism, origins, views, uh, significance. Last week, four views of, of communion. This week, three views of baptism. Uh, baptizo. Let's talk about the word itself, right? Baptizo in the New Testament, and I'm going to differentiate because it sort of gets broader as we look at sort of the usage. In the New Testament, the word baptizo is basically immersion. It also equally would have been used for plunge, to plunge, uh, to wash, to cleanse, to bathe. I like how in Romans, when it talked about um, you know, being baptized into Christ, uh, that, that, was, that was a beautiful picture. It wasn't talking about water baptism at all. It was talking about being immersed, plunged into Christ is the word that was used. It just happened to be baptizo. Well, there's also the broader definition of baptizo that we get from the Septuagint, the first Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture. They use the word baptizo uh, for like uh, the use in uh, Leviticus. A lot of the uh, sacrificial uh, rites and uh, processes, for example, um, where it said take two doves, and it says to basically wring out the blood of one of them and baptizo the other one with them. Now, it's important because that takes on now a little bit different meaning of like to bathe, to drench. It's used with, uh, I think it's Nehemiah uh, talking about uh, being drenched, being baptized uh, in glory. Uh, it talks about to be overwhelmed. Baptism by fire. All right? And so um, to dip, to bathe, to drench now takes on maybe, maybe there's a broader aspect of the sprinkling, um, the pouring, and the immersion. All inclusive, okay. But that's where we get the word. So then we then we sort of move it forward uh, into uh, where we use the word baptism today. Origin. This is an interesting question, and I call it the elephant in the room question for baptism. When you think about the origin of baptism, what do you think about? John the Baptist. Okay. Now my elephant in the room question is. Jesus has not yet been baptized. Churches have not yet been established to practice baptism. What was John the baptizer doing at the Jordan River? What I mean by that is there had not been a New Testament practice of baptism. Remember, Jesus came to him. He, John was already out there baptizing. Yes, Ruth. All right, well, let's look at this. The origin of baptism really is sort of this practice. Within various pagan rituals and ceremonies, there was an aspect of, of washing, of being baptized. Okay? That's not really where we're going with this. Okay? There was an Old Testament ritual purification. In this, we think about um, a, a rite of purity. Leviticus 4 uh, speaks about the priest. Uh, I'm sorry, 16.4. Leviticus 16.4 speaks about the priest who would take off one set of garments before going into the temple and then bathe, baptizo in the Septuagint, bathe themselves in order to purify themselves before putting on the holy garments. Um, 
16, 23, and 24 says of it again, says of Aaron, that uh, Aaron, when he would go in, it was a matter of cleansing with water. So there was this practice within Judaism of sort of water washing and purifying symbolically, ceremonially. And then um, at the time of John the Baptist, there was the baptism of repentance among Jews primarily, who that was a way of confession, a way of sort of coming clean. Where do we see that? Well, and this gets to our elephant in the room question, Luke 3.3. 3. And he, John, John the Baptist, went into the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way. Prophetically, and led by the Lord's guidance, this was part of preparing the way, the way of repentance. Okay? Uh, we also see it in Acts, where Paul will say, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. So, so there's this aspect of repentance and faith that are sort of coessential. Uh, to the idea of what baptism is and what was going on. And so uh, Augustine, in fact, would sort of speak to that later. He would say the baptism itself was setting in motion what it symbolized. It was making it a crucial rite, one in which faith and repentance were coessential. There's that word again. The Christian baptism origin we see with Jesus. <laughs> okay, And then we see in the early church. The fact that baptism was a symbol of purification, of repentance, of, of pro professing a faith and being, being sort of cleansed and purified, that had been going on for centuries. And this was a continuation of that, okay? All these, but um, we see in Matthew 3.3 3, that Jesus came to the Jordan to be baptized by John the Baptist. We see that Jesus commanded baptism in 28.19, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. We see that Luke recorded it various times. We're going to talk about how there are at least 12 examples of baptisms in Luke's uh, record in Acts. Paul writes in Corinthians, he talks about he must have been baptizing people, but here he says, I, I thank God that I didn't baptize some of you, <laughs> so that you may not say that you were baptized in my name. They were starting to say uh, the sort of, this is this passage on the celebrity pastors. Like, you, you claim him, and we claim him, and we claim him. And he says, you know what, I'm glad I didn't baptize all of you. Because you would have just said, well, I'm a, I was baptized by Paul. And that's what you would have rested, you know, that, that proclamation in. Origin, again, I think this is interesting. From the time of Jesus' baptism till about A.D. 250, here are the things that we are going to see uh, happening in the church. Uh, it was universally present. It was universally in water. It was universally in the name of either Jesus or the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It had a universal recognition of church initiation. Baptism in the first two, three centuries was closely tied to a, a, a bringing into the church. That's, that plays important in a couple of our views as well this, this morning. Um, we talked last week, how, or the first week, on the Apostles' Creed, that often it was, we'll wait till Easter to baptize new converts because they will be learning the catechism, the creed, and at Easter we'll baptize, come up, and I'll say, what do you believe? And you'll recite the creed's statements to me. Okay? But that had an aspect of church initiation. Okay? First couple of centuries. We're going to see that, that there was a variety of infant, child, and adult baptisms going on in the first three centuries. There was both immediate baptism, I profess, oh, you need to be baptized, and delayed. I profess, all right, we're baptizing in on Easter. But there was both immersion and pouring. So you're kind of painting a picture here, right? There's, there's, there's some universal consistencies, but it's not totally consistent. I'll, I want to read a couple of examples, too. Well, one, do you guys remember what we have in this book of apostolic followers? What was our earliest church manual? The Didache. And if you're looking for a great gift to give yourself this Christmas, 
the Apostolic Fathers, third edition, has many wonderful early church writings. Clement, Hermas, uh, Barnabas, all kinds of writings. It includes the Didache in Greek and English. So it's, it's just a wonderful little whatever. Christmas, birthday, housewarming. Uh, meet the neighbors. Uh, <laughs> earliest church manual, A.D. 95 to A.D. 125. Concerning baptism, point number seven. Now, concerning baptism, baptize as follows. Whoa! Baptize as follows. Just 50, 60 years from Christ, the apostles. After you have reviewed all these things, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit in running water. This is going to become more evident. There's another example of this. Um, but in running water. But if you have no running water, flexibility, then baptize in some other water. And if you're not able to baptize in cold water, because we want you baptized in cold water, uh, then you can do so in warm. If you have neither, then pour water over your head three times in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Some denominations, churches, globally today, will even baptize three times. There's precedent. And before the baptism, let the one baptizing and the one who is baptized fast, as well as others who are able. Concerning baptism, earliest church manual. Tertullian, one of the early church uh, authors that we talked about, theologians, uh, he would say in AD 198, he would say, uh, I actually advise, so this talks about the practice of infants going on, baptizing infants. He says, I would actually advise that infants and the unmarried wait to be baptized. I don't know why. I, that's, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> uh, that, this is a very good point as well. Um, we take a lot of sort of uh, history from the early church fathers and the early records. Okay, they, they put us there in the sandals. We never say that they're 100% correct or right. In many ways, we would say, well, they would probably be more accurate to a generation or two or three beyond Christ and the apostles. That makes sense. But when it comes to their beliefs and thoughts and opinions and theology, they differed as well. And we're never saying that they were right. We're just reporting, right? We make our own sort of thoughts and we go back to scripture for it. And then the most interesting one, uh, a gentleman by the name of Hippolytus of Rome in AD 200. Again, 200, just a few hundred years. He says at the hour in which the cock crows Early in the morning, they shall first pray over the water. When they come to the water, the water shall be pure and flowing. Do you guys remember a few months ago when we saw the videos from um, our brothers and sisters in India? Do you remember they were at a stream being baptized in cold water? Just saying. Down to the Yadkin, Sonny. <laughs> well, the water shall be pure. <laughs> okay. Well, what? <laughs> We'll have to come up with something else. <clears throat> and flowing. That is the water of a spring or a flowing body of water. They shall take off all their clothes. <laughs> this was the practice of the Edler Church. Now, um, fortunately, modesty would come to rule not long after this, and we would see robes and things like that. But intention, the intention was a transformation of a, a thought of purity, of being cleansed of the old self, whether that was symbolic or regenerative or whatever their thought was in their particular view, that was, that was sort of what went with this as well. The children shall be baptized first. All the children who can answer, answer what? We know Jesus, but what do you believe? The creed. All of those who can answer for themselves, let them answer. If there are children who cannot answer for themselves, let their parents answer for them or someone else from their family. Hmm. Infants. So all of that to show, really, is that when we talk about the first couple hundred years of the church, there was great flexibility and there was little strife. There are no records of just hostile debates in the church, uh, disunity, division, um, uh, there were more important, they were major, they were not majoring in the minors. <laughs> they, they were minor, they were majoring in the majors, right? The heresies of who Christ is, right? That, that's where we're going to spend our time. Uh, otherwise, this is a very important thing, but uh, there's great flexibility. 
Now, a, a spoiler alert. When we get to the end of our approach to baptism and significance, I would suggest that we would have a little bit of this flavored in our own day and time as well. Okay? Great flexibility, little strife. Now, then we get to this next. Oh, yes, Marta. All right. And then we get to this next large window of time. Why do I stop at A.D. 1517? The Reformation. Oh, this is awesome. All right, these classes, we're starting to, starting to pick it up, right? So, so from 250 to 1517, uh, we see that it is primarily infant baptism observed in the church. I don't know if that's a surprise to you or what, but the church records, as we continue to sort of move out of uh, the one church and we start to see these councils, and then over time we kind of have this split with the East and the West, uh, but more and more and more we see a standardized practice of baptism that is infant baptism in the church. Now again, there were a lot of things going on in the church over these next you know, 1,300 years that we would say needed reform. I'm not saying that's one of them. I'm just saying that fell into this as well. A more hard and fast, less flexible uh, application of baptism was occurring. Initially, the theology was mixed. The apostolic church, we see evidence of baptism being symbolic. We see evidence of speaking to it as being regenerative. And when I say that word today, what I mean is that it is the baptismal waters that actually play a role in the salvation of the soul. Okay, does that make sense? Regenerative? And you'll see, you'll see when I talk about one of the views uh, today. But there was also the view uh, that was determining as it being a continuation of covenant theology as well. Okay? That it was, not, it was more than symbolic. It was actually a continuation of sort of uh, being under the household of faith. That was early, initially. Eventually... We start moving, moving, moving toward Rome, toward Rome, and basically all the theology of the church, at least the, um, the visible church, uh, the, the authorized church, was heavy regeneration. We are saved when we are baptized. With, with, a, with a distinction that I don't think some of us Protestants understand is the true doctrine of that. And then we get to the Reformation, and when we come out of the Reformation, just like communion, just like uh, approach to creeds and confessions, just like so much, uh, we almost immediately, within the next 50 to 75 years, we have pretty much three views that we still have today. So do these windows of time sort of make sense? And so we're living in this post-Reformation three-view aspect of baptism. And we're going to look at those today. Three views. We have view number one that is infant, and you'll see the term pedo baptism. Pedo. Pedo is the word for child or children. Um, I think there's a link with like our uh, pediatrician. <laughs> pediatrician, right? Um, I don't know. There's some healthcare personnel if that makes sense in there. I'm pretty sure that's that tie. But in other words, that is the word that we get uh, sort of children and child. But it's the regenerative grace. Okay? View number one of infant baptism is that it is necessary because there is, there is saving power, regenerative power in the water in the practice of baptism. Not just the water, but the praying over and everything else that's associated with that. The second view we're going to take a look at is a second infant pedo baptism. And it is covenant. It is a sign, a covenant sign you're going to start seeing this line up, right? The language of, of the baptism view is likely the language of the communion view as well. Signs and seals, you remember that last week? Signs and seals with our, with our Lord's Supper communion. And then the third view is a credo baptism, adult baptism, and the language we use there is symbols, symbolic. We used that last week with memorial views as well. Generally, they're tied together. Credo. Anybody? I believe. I believe. This is why this view is often called believer's baptism. Remember, that's where we get the word for creed. I believe. So we call it credo baptism. Pedo baptism, credo baptism. Two pedos, one credo. Uh, let's start with that first one. And, and this is an introduction. Again, whoa, we're way up here. Uh, we could spend easily a full hour on each of these views. So if you're online, you probably have a lot that you're thinking, hey, I practice this, we practice this. You didn't even touch on this. I can't today. This is, this is the introduction. 
we go from here and we're curious and we all learn more, okay? Pado baptism number one. We associate this primarily with the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Church of Christ. I don't know if anybody's ever, and there may be some others, but these are the three that primarily rise to the surface when we talk about regenerative pedo baptism. There is an emphasis in pedo baptism on original sin. I'm going to read you something from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And when we talk about baptism, it is the basis of the whole Christian life, the gateway to life in the Spirit. It's regenerative, it's how we, it's how we get life in the Spirit and the door which gives access to the other sacraments, last week, the seven. Through baptism, we are freed from sin and reborn, regenerative, as sons of God. We become members of Christ, are incorporated into the church, and made shares in her mission. Baptism is the sacrament of regeneration through water and the word. So the baptism is is the regenerative act. Now, I do want to stress here, um, we, a lot of times, if we're not familiar with the Roman Catholic Orthodox Church, and, and I, I can't speak to the Church of Christ sort of doctrine, um, what we'll say is, all right, you just believe that infant baptism saves you. And yes, but. Okay, so if we went further into the catechisms of the Catholic Church, we would also find that faith is also required. An affirmation of that faith will be required when the age of ability to affirm that faith is, is reached. The sacrament of confirmation. confirmation. So I like to think of, of the, this view. I have a little thought on each of them, but on this view, this is the uh, life insurance policy baptism. Okay. <laughs> We need to save you until that time, in case something happens, until that time that you can then go through confirmation and save yourself. Okay? So I think that's an important view. I think that's an important sort of, uh, I think, because it's very clearly stated that anyone who receives infant baptism but yet denies their faith at an older age or so um, is not saved. It's made very clear in the Catholic cate Catechism. Yes, Judy. That's a wonderful example um, in the room shared of, of a, 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 a young, uh, an infant who, um, I guess, um, was terminal or, you know, was going to die, I guess. And the, the uh, urgency for baptism is there. Okay. Um, I would suggest, um, again, I would suggest that, A, now we have an appreciation and understanding of why that intention might be. Right. We can understand where that is grounded. Okay. I think it also with what our view would be is that that's a heavy burden to carry, an unnecessary burden. But it is the burden of, hey, let's baptize you until you reach that second sacrament. Okay. It's also a gateway of the church, initiation, that kind of thing, right? But, but that's the view of uh, regenerative pedo baptism. Um, there's also a strong belief of it's one Christian baptism, right? There's no need to be baptized again as an adult. That was your baptism. Okay. As evidence, they'll, they'll point to a lot of early church records, right? That we just read as well. Now, we sometimes get that mixed up with this second version or view of pedo baptism, and that's the one that um, we would actually practice here at River Oaks. Okay, that would be in our uh, EPC Book of Order and our Westminster Confession that uh, that we have a copy of as well. That would be Reformed Methodist. Presbyterian, Lutheran, most Anglican, Moravian, that there would be a similar view around this. Again, we're not getting into the nuances uh, or your particular church, but on the whole, your denominational confessions will speak to this pedo baptism as being the stated doctrine of the church. Okay? Um, this, uh, this also, we talked about how last week communion was the, the subject for which Luther went his way from the rest of the reformers. Okay? This, um, this also is where we see this split from, uh, from infant baptism to adult baptism. And we'll talk about it on the third view. But this, this came up with Luther and the reformers. Uh, the reformers still thought that Luther did not go far enough. Right, Luther. This was never really a qualm with Luther so much, except for justification by grace through faith. He still believed the evidence was present for infants to be baptized, but under a covenant understanding, not a regenerative understanding. 
And then other reformers said, no, no, that's still too similar. We need to change this all up. But this is, this is where Luther sort of stood on it. He, he wanted to emphasize again the covenant theology of the early church. And what I mean by covenant theology is that this is, I'm see what next one is, is that infant baptism is a sign of the promise of God. It is a continuity with, not strict identity with, but continuity with circumcision of the Old Testament. That in circumcision, the infants, the children, uh, in circumcision, the male children, this is why the new covenant is a better covenant, I believe, because it captures all, no, not male or female, not Jew or Gentile, not, you know, it, that's sort of part of the new covenant. But under that sign of the promise, the sign of the covenant that God made with his people, the infants were now brought under the household of faith. Okay? Uh, they were uh, set apart. They were consecrated as, as, as set apart as God's, God's people. Now, this did not save them. This was before faith, but faith still came after the fact. It was the responsibility of the parents, of the community, or of the church, and of the individual to come to a place of saving faith. But this was a sign of the promise, okay? That if you, if you act on that faith, if you act on that promise, then this is what the benefit of that is. The sign and the seal, the benefits of Christ under the new covenant was the same sort of continuity with the old covenant circumcision. The belief is that baptism is valid as a sign and seal when there is one believing parent. And it comes from 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 16, where there's the conversation of if, uh, if a woman has a husband who's not a believer, he's willing to live with her, don't divorce him, and talks about all the things that she could be in his life. But then she, he goes on and says, otherwise your children would be unclean. But as it is, as one believing parent in the house, they are holy. Holy being brought in under the covenant, under the household of God. Okay, so that's where our, our sort of emphasis on one believing parent, there is a valid sort of initiation under the grace of God's community. Okay, um, the biblical early church basis on that, explicitly in Scripture, no. We're, in fact, we're really not going to find explicit instruction or theology on baptism in Scripture. Implicit, yes. Um, is there specific prohibition against any of these? I would suggest against the regenerative view, there is the, 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 uh, the prohibition comes by way of uh, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you will be saved. So tying it to salvation is a prohibitive aspect of Scripture against that view. But against infant baptism and covenant theology, there's no prohibitive a statement against it. So we, we do see the implicit aspect of Scripture. Uh, in Acts, there are 12 references to baptisms. Four of those references use the term oikos. oikos. This is where you read, uh, what's the passage? I said like Acts 16, 14. The Lord opened her heart, talking about Lydia, uh, to Paul's message when she and the members of her oikos, her household, were baptized. Acts 16, 13, immediately he and all his oikos household were baptized. 1 Corinthians 1, 16, yes, I, this is Paul thinking back, I did also baptize the oikos household of Stephanas. Um, this, is, this is one of those that's definitely supportive uh, or used to support the view of infant covenant theology speaking to infants again, because oikos was a word that, sort of, that had a generational meaning to it. Oikos was tied to the idea that it was your father and your father's father and your son and everyone under your household. And I, I would seem to think, as most scholars do on this terminology, that when we see these four episodes or examples of household baptisms, that the structure of the family unit, the use of the word oikos, would be clearly indicating that there were infant children, at least children, not to the point of expressing childlike faith in that household. That was all in one with the terminology that was used. Okay? So that's there. That's sort of an aspect of the biblical basis for pedo baptism covenant theology. Um, also, the promise, the, the verb, uh, the, the usage that Acts 2 
uh, we're talking about the promise is for signs of the promise. The promise is for you and your children, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So again, covenant theology talks about bringing all of, all of those within the household of faith um, under the sign and seal of God's covenant, the new covenant from communion, the new covenant in his blood, not the old covenant. We're, um, well, one more slide on this and I'll, I'll kind of use that example again. Uh, again, the early church, uh, there were no recorded debates or protests over this. Okay, we've talked about that, the flexibility, I think, keeping our mind. Uh, Irenaeus would say in um, AD 180 that for Jesus came to uh, save all. Now, there's some regenerative language here, but then he'll go on later to talk about the need to confess unto faith. But he says, infants, children, youth, and old. Uh, we, we heard from Hippolytus as well, Hippolytus of Rome. Uh, you can't forget that. You can't forget him. Hippolytus of Rome, running water. Uh, cold, take you know, clothes, all that. That's Hippolytus of Rome. So we have those instructions. The ones who cannot speak, they're too young to speak, let someone else confess for them in order to receive the, the, this baptism. Life insurance policy is pedo baptism number one. We're going to save you until you can save yourself. Pedo baptism number two, I like to think of as an engagement ring. I like to think of it as the sign and seal of being uh, in the covenant with God under uh, sort of the direction and the guidance of a household of faith, the one believing parent, two believing parents, the church body, until that time that I can make that marriage official um, and be married. I am not saved under an engagement as I am not married under an engagement, but it, I have stamped on me the sign and seal of my covenant um, household. Uh, also would say one baptism uh, is, it, it, just the scripture will say, one baptism is one baptism. Um, so it's, we, we'll talk about approaching it here in a second because there's always a question about that as well. Here at River Oaks, um, we usually have one a year, one every other year. <laughs> Too, somewhere in there, uh, but um, we do um, celebrate infant baptism here as well uh, as adult baptism, uh, which is our third view. And I think that's important to state because both the first two infant baptisms and this, uh, this third baptism also do support an adult coming to conversion who did not grow up in a household of faith. We, we all are in agreement with what goes on with a profession and believer's baptism. Okay, so all three of these views have this space for, all right, you've come to Christ at a later age, let's baptize you. Okay? And that, though, if it's the only view of your church or your, your theology, then it's credo baptism. Infant baptism is disregarded and validated. Okay? Credo baptism, we think of often as the Anabaptist, right? That was the movement that happened after the Reformation. Uh, Zwingli, who, who had the argument with Luther about uh, this is my body, Zwingli would sort of be an early uh, sort of leader of the Anabaptist, uh, though Zwingli still wanted to leave space for infant baptism. He didn't want it to be adult only. And uh, that the, the, the sort of the proverbial uh, horses were out, out, the, out the stables kind of thing on that one. They're already loose, and he couldn't reel that one back in. Um, and so uh, there was always sort of an understanding when it started. But Baptist, obviously, a lot of non-denominational uh, congregations as well will have credo baptism. Believer's baptism, because it's right there in the word. It's right there in the definition. Uh, when you believe, can express that, you're baptized. Pretty plain and simple. Profession of faith. And one of the questions we always ask uh, for believer's baptism is, uh, you know, why do you want to be baptized? What, what does it and what does it not mean? And then we get to profession of faith. What are you expressing in this? Have you confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? Do you understand that? And do you believe that he came, he lived, he died in order to atone for our sins, in order that we may have eternal? Just a simple profession of faith that is genuine, sincere, uh, that is the association of repentance, past life, and faith. Just like way back with John the baptizer and all who came before and after him, an association of repentance and faith. So we see that in, in credo baptism pretty clear. 
All right, we see a lot of the um, scripture about it. Uh, primarily strictly immersion. Uh, the other views, infant baptisms, actually prefer immersion as well, but it's usually not practical. If you've ever seen an Orthodox church, the, the Greek Orthodox, Russian, any of the Orthodox churches, um, their baptismal is a lot deeper than you think it might be for an infant. And most of them, they'll, they'll come and they'll just go on down with that thing, with, the, <laughs> with that child, <laughs> with that infant, that precious thing. <laughs> It's immersion because, again, the preference really for all of these are immersions, but there's a practicality. There's a middle practice uh, that comes with the pouring and sprinkling uh, that we, we see is sort of in recorded history as well. Uh, but um, e even a Roman Catholic doctrine will say immersion is preferred, but pouring is acceptable. But credo baptism is pretty much all immersion. Uh, it's always going to be that is the only legitimate uh, aspect of baptism. Symbolic, language of symbols of Christ that we have now died to ourself, died to our sins, died to our old self. We have been buried with Christ in his death, and we have been raised to walk in a newness of life. It's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, and, 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 you know, we would say that it's, it's yes, it's symbolic, but it's, wow, it's, it's meaningful. It's, it's, it's real, not from the act itself that that's happening with you, because that's already happened. That's already happened the, the moment we've said, I believe you and I want you as my Lord and Savior. Uh, but the symbolism of that is beautiful. Um, it's a testimony to the resurrection, is really. Most of the doctrine will be very specific to Credo Baptists. And it's the language of ordinance. <laughs> Remember last week we said sacraments, post-Reformation, we started using the word ordinance. And so most doctrine will say that we're celebrating, uh, a Credo Baptist will say the ordinance of baptism today. It is associated with membership most often. Uh, in, in a credo-baptist denomination. It is both um, uh, sort of, uh, it must be performed, there must be proof of a baptism in order to be a member, and then it's also the membership itself occurs with, with a baptism. Um, we would not say that here. Okay? Um, but it's very strict to that. Biblical early church bases, the didache that we've already talked about, um, we talked about uh, being, being adult language there. Uh, Matthew 3, 13 through 17 is uh, Jesus being baptized. And then Jesus saying, go out, teach uh, others, uh, be baptized. And Acts 8, 35 through 39 is when the Ethiopian eunuch has been to Jerusalem, likely Passover. He's picked up these scrolls from Isaiah, and he says, I'm reading them. How can I understand them? I don't know uh, what they are. And so Philip says, well, let me just let me tell you about what this has pointed us to, to the Jesus, da, 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 da. Goes down the road, says, well, hey, there's some water. Baptize me. And so there's, there's some biblical basis to the adult profession of faith, and then... Um, baptism. I would suggest that, uh, well, especially the eunuch, and again, A, uh, we all do believe in believers' profession of faith baptism, but I would also suggest in the early centuries, uh, these were first generation believers. There were first and second and third generation uh, believers uh, for a couple hundred centuries, and so there were no household of faiths, right? And so there, it would make sense that over the first 200 years, a majority of those baptized were all adults. Okay? There's records of some of the ones who would become like the first children of believers to be baptized. Uh, but we sort of have this wave that would, would solely only be adults primarily uh, as first generations until churches took on the vows of infants as well within a, one believing parent. Okay. But hopefully three, three views at least starting to be distinct in your mind. I, I know I didn't answer all your questions, but those are the views. I, before we go, though, I want us to sort of say, what do we do with that, right? What do we do with that? Um, the significance. I would suggest that approaching baptism, uh, River Oaks, uh, the EPC, would say that baptism is a non-essential, being that there is liberty in it, flexibility. You did not hear me say that it's not extremely important. <laughs> it's still an act of obedience. It's simply a non-essential in the idea of infant or adult. And, that, and I think that's evident in the fact that we have these conversations with parents who want to baptize their infant, and I can surely teach to that. I can feel good about being uh, biblically, uh, historically, covenantal 
uh, Lee, <laughs> uh, accurate about it and, and, uh, and celebrate that. Uh, and also for those parents who say, we think we would rather our children wait, there's great liberty in that as well. And we will support you in that as well. Okay? But it's extremely important. The idea is it's biblical obedience. It's a testimony of the old life, the new life. It is a sign and seal sacrament. It is that engagement ring. Uh, and if profession of faith, it is that marriage ring. It is that stamp uh, on your life publicly uh, of professing Christ and, and the benefits of his life, death, resurrection. And it is initiation into the visible church. Not local membership, but the visible church. Those on this world who visibly say, I am part of the body of Christ. Not everyone who's in the visible church is in the invisible church, which is those who have genuinely professed and truly believe Lord Jesus is Lord and Savior, saying, meaning that some will be baptized that have not been truly regenerated. Okay, That's a whole other class as well, meaning that some don't really know what they're doing or they're doing it for the wrong reason. They're now part of the visible church, but not the invisible church. But the visible church is very important. It's a body of believers. Okay. Uh, approaching baptism, one baptism. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, we talk about the one body, one spirit, uh, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Um, in short, if you come to River Oaks and you have had, and you've been, um, uh, had an infant baptism, and uh, maybe it was in a different uh, Presbyterian church. Uh, maybe it was in a Lutheran church, Reformed church. Uh, maybe it, uh, who knows where. could be any church. Uh, we're not going to invalidate that just on the basis of you weren't baptized in our church as an infant. And if you come and say, hey, I think I need to be baptized again, we're actually first going to have a conversation and encourage you not to. Uh, we're going to understand, were you in a household of faith when you were baptized as an infant? then, then you're, there, there's really, from a covenant standpoint, there's no obligation. There's not, you're not walking in disobedience by not being baptized. Um, then we'll have a further conversation of why it is, and, and it may be a reaffirmation of that baptism, and we baptize you as an adult. Okay? But we do believe that one baptism is valid, whether it was an infant baptism or an adult profession of faith. One baptism. Um, counseling and assurance. Again, parents of infants or adults... Uh, we're not going to say, it's why you don't see in the service, hey, who would like to be baptized? Let's go. We want to ask those questions. We want to understand why and that it truly is. It's very important so that it is tied to repentance and faith. And we want you to have that assurance uh, if you're being baptized for that one baptism. Okay, so we always have a counseling aspect to it, and uh, then we're ready to go. Uh, it's an Apostles' Creed belief. If you say, I don't know if I'm ready for baptism. Well, if you genuinely in your heart can say and live the Apostles' Creed, the essentials, the minimum standard to what it means to say, I'm a Christian, then that's the confession of baptism. So if, if you ever thought, are you talking to anyone who says, well, I don't know if I'm ready for baptism, walk down the creed. So do, you, do, you, do you believe this? And it may be a teaching opportunity. I don't believe it all but that. Well, okay, we don't have the time out on the baptism. Let's, let's get to this. And then use that as sort of that, uh, that conversation around readiness for baptism. Celebrate and remember. A lot of times when we're doing baptisms, we're back in the green room while the worship service starts and all the music and you guys are singing and we're sitting down with the family or the individual. We're getting all the logistical aspects, right? You know, just so we're going to walk up, you go the steps. This is how I stay most dry and you get most wet. And uh, we're going to talk through that. And then we're going to pray over you. And one of the prayers that I always pray over those baptized is that this moment will just be burned on your heart. Not that there's anything special in the water. But it's that declaration of repentance and faith that you're making publicly or you are being um, sort of lifted up as, a, as an infant, your infant, your child, because you're going to teach them the aspects of covenantal uh, theology. This is such a such important moment that all, all the rest of your days, when you have issues that, uh, that may bring doubt, when you have issues that are difficult, challenging, that this is one of those moments that says, you know, the sign and seal of my profession is secure, and my baptism was a reminder of that. What a day. What a day. I'll celebrate that with you. And so I, I think that's one of the aspects of approaching baptism that we sometimes maybe don't 
say. Um, I will say <laughs> for the longer version of this, really, really done well. Many years ago, as you can tell, we refer to it as the cassette tape. <laughs> It's the cassette tape that Pastor Beatty did on baptism. It's what he gives any parent uh, who comes and says, I would like my child to be considered for infant baptism, or I have questions. Should I have them wait? He gives them this tape, which is now digitized, and we've got a file. It's an MP3 for whatever that is. So uh, if you're ever interested in that, let our office know. We will send you that file. It is well done, probably, what, 30 minutes, Sonny, something like that? And it really goes into those two views and why we view it as a non-essential as far as liberty and which way you choose. But we want it to be the parents' you know, decision on that, and we want them to be informed. Also, if you have a little bit longer and you're just really, really into this, um, there are 45-minute presentations by two of the greatest contemporary Bible scholars, R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur. They had a conversation on baptism together, and what it really highlights in both of them is the great respect they have for one another. The great acknowledgement that both of their beliefs and the bodies and congregations that they have helped shepherd over the years have approached baptism with a right heart, and a right view and a scripture first sort of aspect. And yet they then go to tell you about how different they are. And it's okay. And that's what they I'm do justice to much of what I've left off. Uh, and I've done injustice too, probably. So I highly recommend that. Being part of this last few weeks. This, is, this has been fun for me. I hope it, again, plants seeds, gets us moving, you guys online. Uh, and let me just close with prayer.